my research focuses on the environmental determinants of health. And in particular, I've spent uh, the last 10 years focusing on how climate change will impact populations' health and how we can adapt to that. Some of what I do uh, tries to borrow tools from public health and apply it to grand challenges in social sciences. So I'm trained as an epidemiologist and a geographer, so I really try and cross-fertilize those two. And one of the research programs I've been working on has been to try and answer the big questions in climate change research. In particular, are we adapting to climate change and how can we track adaptation in Canada and globally? I think the general public's main mis misconceptions are that, in fact, we are adapting to climate change and making progress, and in fact, that we even know what it is. Um, one of the grand challenges in climate research, and particularly for adaptation, is what does adaptation look like? How do we measure it? How do we know when we're actually doing it? And it turns out that we don't, and we're still struggling with this. Well, welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mini Science series, uh, Weather and Climate Going to Extremes. So please join me in welcoming Leah, and she's talking about adaptation to climate. So I want to take you over to more of the social sciences side of climate research and focus on adaptation. My agenda is going to start off with, I want to talk about the adaptation challenge and here really looking at the big picture question of why we should care about adaptation. Move on to what is adaptation? What does it actually look like? How does it differ from mitigation? What does this word actually mean uh, in the climate change community and discourse? And then come back again to the adaptation challenge, what I call part two. And this is where I want to get into the messiness and the murkiness and, and the real difficulties of um, the challenge when you, when you go underneath the surface and start to really think about what this challenge looks like. I'll then move on to are we adapting and, and, and try and provide you with some examples and what is the evidence that we're adapting? Um, what does the research look like when we actually ask the question, are we adapting? How do we even answer that question? And then finish with a bit of reframing the question. What I think are some of the really important sub-questions that we as society need to answer in order to respond to the adaptation challenge. And then I'll finish off with trying to come back to the, the question of the talk, how do we adapt to climate change? So that the climate is changing and that this will have significant impacts on society is now irrefutable. And to a large extent, some of the changes in climate are irreversible. So we know from the recent in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change fifth assessment report there's a quote here, under all assessed scenarios for adaptation and mitigation, some risk from adverse impacts remains with very high confidence. What this means is even if we were to reduce carbon dioxide uh, and other greenhouse gas emissions to zero today and undertake significant adaptations, there would still be adverse impacts. Okay? And these are irreversible and these are related to the emissions that we have already put into the atmosphere. Now, in this context, we've actually been highly unsuccessful in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So we're nowhere near this optimistic scenario of just some impacts. We're probably looking at significant impacts. And so you can see on the graph there on the left, we're actually following the black line is us. We're following some of the higher emission scenarios. We've, we've really been unsuccessful on mitigation. Hence, we will have to adapt to the impacts, whether we're adapting to moderate impacts or major impacts um, depends more on uncertainty about how we will respond than uncertainty in the models. Most of the uncertainty is what we're going to do about this. Um, and that's greater than a lot of the climatic uncertainty in the models. And climate change has really, uh, really hit discourse in the public and in politics over the last couple of years in particular. It's exploded onto the stage, I think, in a, in a much, much more significant way. So just last month at a meeting of the leaders of Canada and the United States, the major topic on the agenda was climate change. This would have been unheard of five years ago. The number one topic, climate change, okay, just last month. In Montreal, just in the past few months, we've seen the release of Montreal's Climate Change Adaptation Plan. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. And even more locally, here at McGill, climate change discourse has been quite significant with a lot of discussion and controversy and debate over the Divest McGill movement.
So let's, let, let's, get, let's get to the meat of the question. What can we do about climate change? There's really two policy responses, two main areas that, that we can undertake to respond to the challenge of climate change. The first is what we call mitigation, reducing emissions. So this is slowing or stop, well, not stopping, realistically, slowing the process of climate change by reducing the emissions that are causing it in the first place. So we call this mitigation, and for those of you who attended the previous talks, there was probably a stronger focus on kind of this circle. What can we do to mitigate? What are the causes and the sources of climate change? And, and, and how can we understand that side of, of the climate cycle? Reducing emissions includes things like moving to renewable, cleaner energies, conserving energy, using it more efficiently, sustainable transportation, so trying to decrease emissions from transportation, cars, airplanes, for example. Um, more active transportation, again, trying to reduce emissions due to, um, due to car travel, truck, um, air travel. And carbon sinks, so let's take some of the emissions we are already emitting and try and hide them away so they can't get up into the atmosphere. So these are the types of approaches that are associated with mitigation. The second approach, and a totally different type of approach, is what we call adaptation. Adaptation assumes, from a baseline, that there will be impacts. It assumes climate change. It doesn't focus on slowing climate change. It focuses on what are we going to do about the climate changes that we're facing. Some of the examples of adaptation activities improve disease surveillance so that we're ready if there's new and emerging diseases so that we know when they're happening. Emergency preparedness for extreme weather events. We know that in many, many areas, increased variability of weather, there'll be um, uh, increased frequency and magnitude of storms and droughts, for example. So can we have improved emergency preparedness in those events? Weatherproofing or upgrading infrastructure. We may need infrastructure, roads, pipes, dams, to be, to be developed under different scenarios. We develop them now under scenarios that, um, for example, a flood is a one, one in 20 year event. We now need to, to develop that infrastructure or upgrade it, upgrade it to a one in five year event, for example. So infrastructure and regulations around infrastructure need to no longer be based on past trends, but on future trends. Relocation of populations in some case. This is a, a quite a drastic adaptation response, but for some small island states, uh, low-lying areas, full relocation and abandonment of lands will, be will likely be necessary in the medium to long term. Usually this is related to sea level rise. And perhaps most importantly is reducing the determinants of vulnerability. So it's well understood in the climate community that climate changes will manifest their impacts through existing social health issues and inequalities. What that means is you could have one population experience the same storm as another population, but they will be differentially impacted based on how vulnerable they are. So if you have a storm in New York and you have the exact same storm in Lagos, in Nigeria, the impact will be different. We may not be able to change the storm, the frequency, the magnitude. What we can change is the, how we will be affected by that storm. And those changes are often related to these social vulnerability factors like poverty, inequality. So much adaptation research focuses on what we can do. We can change how vulnerable we are. So you'll often hear people when they talk about adaptation talk about things like poverty, inequality, health systems. And that's because if we accept that we can't fix all of the climatic problems, we need to strengthen our ability to absorb and reduce and mitigate the impacts. I shouldn't use the word mitigate the impacts, should I? That's confusing you. There's also something called co-benefits. These are sort of the win-win options. These are interventions or actions that are good for mitigation as well as being good for adaptation. So, for example, green infrastructure, expanding tree canopy, local food, smart growth. If you stop using your car, okay, you are improving your health, improving the health system, reducing probably burden on the healthcare system, and reducing your emissions at the same time. 
So this is looking for things that help with mitigation and adaptation goals. There are times where adaptation can conflict with mitigation. For example, rapid economic development in, um, in the least developed countries in order to improve poverty, in order to act on poverty can actually result in increased emissions. So co-benefits get, gets at this idea of finding interventions that work for both mitigation and adaptation goals. So what is adaptation? Let's, let, let's get it, we, we have to have a definition. You're in a university and I'm an academic and so we always have to have one slide that defines something. Um, and this turns out to be quite important. I'll come back again and again to the question of what is adaptation. So the formal definition from the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is that adaptation refers to adjustments in ecological, social, or economic systems in response to an actual or expected climate stimuli and their effects or impacts. It refers to changes in processes, practices, and structures to moderate potential damages or to benefit from opportunities associated with climate change. If you felt like that didn't elucidate a whole lot for you, <laughs> that's what definitions tend to do. Um, what we're talking about here, and the reason it's so wishy-washy, the reason that this feels murky, it doesn't have corners, we're not quite sure what, what this is actually telling us, is because adaptation is a murky word. It's a bit like sustainability, health. Not entirely sure what it means, and it can mean a whole heck of a lot of things. It can mean the changes made by an individual farmer in any country responding to the fact that their crop isn't doing as well and they're going to change their crop because there's not as much rain. It could be um, a national government making the decision to improve poverty eradication strategies because they're worried about climate impacts. This could be um, an insurance company raising the price of home insurance in areas that are predicted to have more severe weather events or refusing to insure in flood prone areas that are increasingly flooding. So adaptation can be actions, policies, anything that reflects a response to how the climate is changing. So the adaptation process in theory, how do, we, how do we go about adapting, right? How do we practically do this thing called adaptation? Usually follows, there's a bunch of different frameworks, but it usually follows these sort of core ideas. You start by assessing your impacts, vulnerabilities, and risk. You sort of look at whatever it is you're looking at, your country, your city, your crop. You try and decide where there are climate sensitive sensitivities. How climate is going to change in the future, okay, and therefore where your risk is. So if you were the cranberry industry in Ontario, you're going to decide, yes, this is great. We need to expand and aggressively invest because cranberries are going to do better. If you are the wine industry in Italy, you're going to say, crap, we need to be really, really careful because you know, the tiny changes in climate are going to have huge impacts on our wine products. And you're going to try and quantify that. What is the nature of these risks? When is this going to happen? What do we need to prepare for? So that's assessing impacts, vulnerability, and risks. The next step is plan for adaptation, sitting down and prioritizing. What are the most important things we need to do now? How are we going to pay for them? What are they going to do? What are they going to look like? And this usually involves quite a bit of stakeholder involvement. Implement adaptation measures. You go out and you do it. You do whatever you said you were going to do. And then you monitor and evaluate. Easy. Around this, of course, are all these enabling activities that need to happen. Raising awareness and ambition. There being just political, political will and public will for this. Providing political space for engagement, sharing information, facilitating financial and technological support, engaging stakeholders to, to decide what our priorities are moving forward and strengthening institutional capacities. So there's a lot of this background, high-level activity that needs to occur to support this process. What I'd like to do is give you a couple details, just to give you an example of what different places and groups are doing on adaptation to see how this process is working. So this is an example from the United States Centers for Disease Control. I will be using a few health examples. That's because my background is as an epidemiologist in health. So if you see that theme coming up, that's my personal bias. So the CDC uses what they call the BRACE framework. 
building resilience against climate change effects. This is very similar to the last circle slide I showed you. Similar ideas, you start on, on one with evaluating vulnerabilities and risk, the orange point two, trying to figure out what the future disease, how that will affect health, disease burden. Three, assessing public health interventions. So what are our options to deal with these risks? And onward, very, very similar to the last slide. And they call this the Brace Framework. And they funded 14 states and two cities, and this was based on by open call. So states and cities put forward plans that said, we want to adapt to climate change or the health effects of climate change. And this is our plan. So that's being funded now. You can see the, um, the states and the cities listed here. Most of that work to date has focused on the stages one and two, okay? So assessing, what are the problems? What are the risks? How do, we, how do we project climate change? How do we work with climate data? So they have these reports. You can see the examples of the reports there on climate models, using climate models and climate projections, assessing climate vulnerability to change. And their next phase of funding, which they're going to post in the next few months, is specifically for these exact areas, these states and these cities, to try and get them further along that wheel, to try and get them to implementing, to planning actual actions and implementing them. So that's what's going on at the Centers for Disease Control. That's equivalent to Canada's Public Health Agency of Canada, or Health Canada. In Montreal, we just recently got our um, adaptation strategy. So this is the first Montreal uh, city level adaptation strategy. It just came out in the last couple months. And most of the strategy focuses on risks, impacts, and vulnerabilities. So um, I probably too fuzzy to read, but we're worried about storms. We're worried about flooding. Um, we're worried about potential disease events. So we've identified the things we think are the most important and most sensitive. And Montreal did extensive consultation on this. What do we think are the problems? Let's talk to experts. Let's talk to stakeholders. And then how do we think those things are going to be impacted by climate change? Okay. What are the scenarios and the models that tell us how all these risks are going to be impacted by climate change? And therefore, what are our adaptation priorities? That's where we are in Montreal. So as you can see, I gave you some numbers, 28 pages focused on vulnerability, two on adaptation measures. So we're not, we're not quite there yet, right? We, we sort of have ideas of the types of adaptations that need to be undertaken, but we're not at the action. We're at the early planning stages. In a bit of contrast, an example from northern Canada. Northern Canada has some of the best adaptation planning in the world. And this is because it's one of the places that will see the greatest changes in climate in the world. And in fact, they're seeing them already. It's not a future issue. It's a present issue. So Atlin, BC, population approximately 400, has an excellent adaptation plan. They've identified key risks, forest fires, power outages, disease outbreaks, isolation. They've prioritized through stakeholder engagement climate scenarios for these risks. And this table is a quantification of what people thought was really important in their, in their consultations, what mattered to people to decide which risks they would focus on. They identified five key goals that they were going to focus on in the immediate future. And, and they identified action items around them. So for example, one of, their, um, one of their goals was to address limited availability of volunteers. This is directly in, to, in response to concern around extreme weather events. So when you have people that go out on the land, for example, and they get stuck, somebody needs to be there um, to deploy to help them, OK? Because there's not a lot of formal emergency services, and they're very remote. So this table identifies a number of very specific interventions they're going to do, including something as detailed as create incentives for volunteers in order to keep them and sort of not lose the capacity, not, not lose numbers and keep people volunteering by, for example, offering them free training in different kinds of areas of first aid and, and response so that they can get something from volunteering. Um, and there's tables and tables of these very specific examples. Okay. So much more detailed, much farther on that path of planning um, and intervening. No monitoring. There's no monitoring globally, pretty much. Not zero, but pretty close to zero. Okay. 
The Canadian, at the Canadian federal level, there's actually been quite a bit of work done by ministries, units, departments across, um, across the Canadian government, but there's been basically no coordinated activities at the federal level in Canada on adaptation. So if you go to this website, Canada's Economic Action Plan, it's actually a broken link, the climate change adaptation part. Um, and if you go to this website, more information focused on Cana how Canadians adapt, you might not be able to read that, but at the bottom, the federal adaptation policy framework is available upon request. You have to email for the PDF. Um, I'm pretty sure the federal government has enough web space to actually have this PDF posted. And it used to be up there. It was actually pulled. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this federal adaptation policy framework and what it actually looks like if you were to get a hold of it. Um, but so, so we've had no coordination at the national level in Canada. That's not to say there's not a lot done by federal employees. There actually is a lot done. Canada is a leader in a lot of areas, but national coordination is not something we've done. It's been um, decentralized. So I also want to provide you a bit, um, a bit of an a insight into adaptation and context. So if we zoom into local areas, I want to give you a bit more of a global perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a video. It's about four to five minutes. And it gives you a perspective from three of the areas I'm working in with my research team in the Canadian Arctic, in the Peruvian Amazon, and in southwestern Uganda in remote indigenous communities. Now this video was designed for sort of a research project, so there's a lot about rah rah us, this is our research project, this is what we're doing. So that's not what I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to wave a rah rah me flag, but you get, to, you get to hear a little bit of the story on vulnerability and the experiences and some of the adaptation ideas going on. The Indigenous Health Adaptation to Climate Change, or IHAC, project is an international research project led by McGill, Cayetano, and Macarere Universities. This project brings together researchers and professionals from different areas of expertise. This five-year project is dedicated to understanding how climate change affects the health of remote Indigenous communities. In particular, it asks how Indigenous health is vulnerable to changes in climate, but also how and how effectively Indigenous communities can adapt to these changes. The IHAC team is working with remote Indigenous communities in three regions, with the Inuit in the Canadian Arctic, Batwa Pygmies in southwestern Uganda, and the Shipibo and Shawi Indigenous peoples in the Peruvian Amazon. We have limited understanding of how climate change will affect the health of Indigenous populations globally. So the IHAC project is working with communities in Peru, Uganda, and the Arctic to understand how their health will be affected by climate change and to help identify actions that will aid them in adapting to these changes. After consulting with communities, IAC has identified three key health priorities. Food security, or having access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. Water security, or having access to enough potable water. And vector-borne diseases, or infections that are transmitted by insects. There are also concerns common to all three regions. These include children's health and generational transitions, globalization and resource development, and preservation and transmission of indigenous knowledge. Working with communities, indigenous organizations, and governments at the local, national, and international level, IHAC is committed to following ethical research practices. The different regional teams have extensive working relationships with the communities, and the IHAC team as a whole is actively involved in developing the ethical protocols for climate change research in small indigenous communities. The project partners with the communities and uses participatory research methods, which means that the community is actively involved in all parts of the research, and both the process and results are shared between the community and research team. An overarching theme of the project is to investigate the differences and similarities of Indigenous experiences in adapting to climate change. In particular, how changing environments influence Indigenous health. In applying both scientific and traditional Indigenous knowledge, IHAC hopes to empower remote communities to better adapt. The project uses a vulnerability approach, which looks at the capacity or ability of communities to adapt to changes in climate that affect their health. The vulnerability approach looks at exposure, exposure in this case to climate change, then the, the response to that exposure, 
and then adaptation mechanisms to that exposure and the impacts. IHAC's ongoing Burden of Health Study and Health Systems Analysis are establishing baselines of Indigenous health in the study areas. They allow for a better understanding of how the health of Indigenous communities are sensitive to changes in climate, as well as their current capacity to adapt. These studies also focus on the future or projected vulnerability of Indigenous health. The IHAC project has helped create policy briefings for governments to highlight how these results can inform government initiatives and priorities. The project is currently working with communities to identify pilot interventions. For example, in Peru, we are helping communities to set up a rice cropping cooperative to help reduce the risk of food insecurity. The project is also working closely with Inuit communities in the Canadian Arctic to build an Indigenous knowledge bank to be used by communities to prevent, prepare for, and manage the impacts of climate change on health. So that gives you a, a bit of a lens into what happens at the local level. And you can, you can sort of grasp the scale of this challenge when we think about the fact that, that we need to both address and consider what local responses will be in individual com communities, but as well as in, within the context of um, the fact that the driver of interest, or one of the main drivers, is global. So, so dealing with a challenge of this magnitude and scale is really unprecedented. Why have we not progressed beyond vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans? We're still in the really early stages. Well, the first answer is we're still in the early stages. Um, the, the sort of discourse and commitment to climate change is still relatively recent, and this is a fairly big undertaking. So to be fair, um, it just takes a long time to do those first, two, first couple of stages. And let's look again. I'm into the section on the adaptation challenge part two, because I want to dive in a little bit deeper into the messiness. Let's look a little bit at what that means when we actually try and do that first circle that identify risks and vulnerabilities. So this is from the assessment report five, again, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Just summarizing nicely and pictorially, they have some good graphic artists here at, there at the IPCC. See, um, just take a glance at how many impacts. These are broad categories, so anything with a tractor is impacts on food production, a little red tractor. Anything with a little red family is impacts on livelihoods, health, and or economics. These are huge categories all over the world. Okay? The impacts are so widespread, so difficult to grapple with. Basically, we're somewhat overwhelmed with how to even assess the impacts, and they're all very diverse. Okay? So it's not that climate change will impact this and impact this, and that's the only pathway. There's so many different places where climate change is one of another of factors. Climate change feels like it affects everything a little bit. So the mass impact of climate change is quite significant, but every single impact, climate change is only a part of the story. So you'll have heard questions like, did climate change cause Hurricane Katrina? No. Did climate change cause anything? No. But it's part of the picture. Climate change is going to increase the likelihood of storms like Hurricane Katrina. And climate change isn't going to increase the likelihood or the frequency or the magnitude of other stuff. But for any individual event, climate change is just never the major culprit. It's sort of like this necessary or important accessory in every crime, but it never pulled the trigger. Okay? So what does that mean for actually assessing the risks? Okay? How do you, how do you impl implicate climate change? And how do, you, how do you deal with this trajectory without getting wrapped up in other stuff? Just to focus on health here, this is the um, Centers for Disease Control's map. This actually is supposed to turn nicely and be very animated, but I can never figure out how to download the animated version. Um, just looking at health, look at all the possible pathways. Air pollution can affect asthma and cardiovascular disease. Heat affects heat stress. Water and food supply impacts affect malnutrition, diarrhea, algal blooms. Mental health impacts affect anxiety, despair, depression, depression post-traumatic stress. Waterborne disease affects um, potential infectious diseases like cholera, cryptosporidiosis, campylobacter, leptospirosis. Some of these issues are huge grand challenges. Mental health, I and mean, that's a grand challenge, never mind climate change. How do you begin to decide how to adapt to all of this. And this is just the health sector. And this is just the United States. So where do you begin? So the scale of the challenge means that you just get stuck 
in the assessment phase. And there's other stuff going on. So this um, is to show you some of, the, some of the linkages. So if a particular country has failure of major crops, that could cause geopolitical conflict, okay, which could cause significant social instability, um, which could co cause economic crises that will spiral to neighboring countries, potentially globally. Um, if there is a competition over increasingly scarce resources, um, again, that can cause conflict. If some, if some major countries have economic problems, that will spiral into potentially global economic problems. Uh, the list goes on. The interconnectivity is huge. Okay? So if we add in interconnectivity, it gets even messier. So you can begin to see the scale of the challenge. So to borrow from Evan and Stoddard, who actually used this phrase in the context of health inequality, adaptation is sort of everything all the time. Anything is adaptation. Everything is adaptation. We need to adapt everywhere. We need to adapt to everything. Anything could be considered eligible for being called adaptation or needing to be more adaptive. Where do we begin? So it's very overwhelming. And this is one of the main reasons that, that we haven't gotten very far, is the scale and the unmanageability of the challenge. So coming back to the adaptation process, well, OK, we haven't got very far in that process. What are some of the other reasons why not? Why can't we get past this first stage? Well, we're caught up in assessing impacts, vulnerability, and risk. So what are some of the opportunities here? Well, the good news is that if you look at this list on adaptation side, these are all kind of good ideas anyway. Okay? These are things that it's, in some cases, except for relocation of populations, um, it, it's sort of hard to go wrong. Many of the adaptation responses, interestingly, are what we call no regrets. So well, if we fight poverty, and it turns out that that wasn't important to climate change adaptation. <laughs> we shouldn't have fought poverty. So many of the adaptation responses tend to be, or at least enough to give us choices, tend to be no regrets responses, meaning they're good things anyway. They also, interestingly, don't require very precise data. So there's, there's, a, there's a debate in the climate change community that's, that, that we're expecting too much certainty. How much precision do we really need in our climate models and impacts predictions of how much one temperature in one location, how many extra cases of diarrhea, and in another country, how many extra cases of malaria, 4.3 cases per month extra, how much precision do you need to say that poverty reduction is going to help? How much precision do you need to say that distribution of mosquito nets is probably the good response? Okay, so we've been caught up in the desire to have certainty and precision and get the data right when the actionable information needed to adapt and the options we often come to really don't necessitate that. So we are caught up in that circle when we may not need that circle to be that strong in order to continue on the pathway. Okay. So I was at a meeting at the Centers for Disease Control just a couple weeks ago, and this was because they were asking, why are all the people where states and cities were funding? Why haven't they gotten past circle one and maybe into circle two? And the main reason is they're bogged down in precise data. And they just don't feel they need it. And they say, we're the cities and we're the states that are on the forefront. We're the ones that got, had the winning proposals to get money. What are we going to do about the small rural areas who are never going to have the expertise and data? We need to have ways to get through this pathway okay, that isn't going to be held back. Okay? There's also co-benefits. We can also just begin prioritizing by those things that are good ideas, no regrets, and that have co-benefits. Okay? So there's some really quick things we could narrow down. Or the adaptation options that respond to a broad number of potential impacts and are not very sensitive to uncertainty. So things where it's hard to go wrong. Okay? There are a lot of options, okay? but, but we like precision. I want to talk about a different circle here, the circle we never get to, the monitoring and evaluating adaptation circle. So in order to spend money, Okay, to justify spending of money, we have to be able to evaluate 
that money. We have to be transparent and, 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 and convince governments and spenders and taxpayers that that money is being used well. And we're talking billions. Okay? The commitment from developed countries to developing countries over time is huge. Okay? Talking billions of dollars committed. And the expectation is that that money okay, will be accounted for. We want to know that our money is going to adaptation. You're going to have to show us, Africa, that you're adapting. Okay? That's important. Okay? So how do we monitor and evaluate adaptation? <clears throat> So some of the questions that arise are we, how does Canada compare to other countries? How do we stack up? Is Montreal doing well? How do we know when we're doing well? Are we responding to the right risks? Do we actually know that we're reducing risk? Is it enough for the threat of climate change? These are pretty important questions. We have no idea. None. Okay? Almost all of the work on adaptation has been in specific context theoretically based, looking at barriers, and is, is theoretical and qualitative and in the social sciences. And that's good, right? We need social sciences, qualitative and theoretical work in this field. But we need it to be complemented by comparative analysis to actually ask the hard question, well, qualitative questions are hard too, but to ask the, the questions like this. It's like, okay, at the end of the day, we need to be able to compare. We need to have milestones. We need to have baselines. This isn't being done. In mitigation, mitigation is messy. Okay, but, but we do have a unit of analysis. We do know that we can measure emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, and we can allocate them, can have a sense of what sectors they're coming from, um, what are the sources, and we can begin to sort of plan quantitatively um, where, where their priorities are. We also know, know what differential country emissions are. So the US is that, that big red circle, Canada's knobbed onto it, China's the big blue circle. So we know who the emissions are coming from. Well, what is the unit of analysis of adaptation? How do you measure adaptation, given how murky I've just suggested to you it is? So adaptation is a whole lot messier if we actually want to do this, this add the level of rigor that we have in mitigation to the adaptation field. So this was the grand question I came up with with some colleagues over a glass of wine um, where great ideas sometimes emerge. Um, are we adapting to climate change? And, and the sort of sub-question here is, how do we answer that question? Right? Like, let's try. You know, let's see what we can do. And we started with the low-hanging fruit. We started with the, well, let's just see what's out there in the literature, see what we're doing. Let's just kind of gather together what people are saying about climate change and start there. So over the last seven years, this is the question that we've been working on. And I'd like to show you some of our results or some of the things we've learned. First, adaptations don't tend to be stimulated by the threat of long-term changes. 100 years from now, something's going to happen. Or over time, there'll be slow changes, so I need to respond. Adaptations are occurring in response to extreme weather events, like storms, individual events, and changes in variability in a human lifespan. This isn't a surprise, but it's important. What actually create, what are the incentives for people and countries and groups to act? It's not long-term climate, it's weather variability now. And at this meeting with the CDC, the um, a representative from New York City stood up and said, you need to stop talking about climate change. If you want people to act, you need to start talking about how does weather affect you now and how can we deal with that? And that'll be relevant to climate change, but stop talking about the long term. He said, we're pragmatic. I want to know about weather impacting my city now. The global distribution of adaptation reporting, this is reporting, is inequitable. So as might be expected, there's a lot of work in reporting on adaptations in high-income countries. Interestingly, there's actually quite a bit on low-income countries, funded by high-income countries. But there's a bit of a gap for these middle-income countries. There's not a lot going on. They can't afford it, and nobody's funding it for them. We also did some mapping of health adaptations to try and see where countries were on um, adaptation policy for health. So uh, red is doing nothing. Um, yellow is groundwork, so adaptation plans, vulnerability assessments, and green is something, anything. We had another color, monitoring and evaluation, but nobody was doing it. Right? So it just kind of got dropped off. Right? That would be the ultimate next step. You know, let's call it blue or gold. Um, so this particular graph is actions, um, national policies to prepare for extreme weather events 
in the face of the threat of storms under climate change. Uh, Canada stacks up well. Again, this is health. Canada does quite well in health. We're third um, for adaptations at the federal level. Um, among OECD nations, these are sort of neighboring comparers um, or similar nations, Canada is a leading adapter in health. This is actually one of the areas we do quite well. But among the nations in this sort of high adapting group, among the high adapters, Canada is the only one with no legislation for adaptation in any sector. Um, sorry, they don't all have it, but most of, the, most of the countries doing high levels of adaptation have this, Canada doesn't. We also have no na national adaptation plan, which is also exceptional. Canada was an outlier. Um, Canada is doing a lot. Again, it's happening at the lower ministerial level, but coordinated leadership, legislation, adaptation plans, we don't have it. We have this framework, but the framework, um, I said I'd come back to it, the framework focuses on Canada's federal role or jurisdiction in dealing with climate, but it doesn't actually plan anything. <clears throat> we looked at cities around the world, 401 cities over 1 million people, to see what they're doing, at least what we could find, what we could access. Um, there's plenty of things probably going on, but what could we find? So watch closely. These are all the cities we looked at. I'm going to show you the cities that we're, we could find nothing on. Ready? So did you get that? I'll do it again. There's all the cities. Nothing. OK. So only 15% reported doing anything. Another 2% were doing planning. They were at the planning stages, um, mostly in high-income countries, but not necessarily. There were a few really interesting examples outside of um, high income nations. And these are cities over 1 million. These are all cities with websites, you know, municipal garbage collection. Even in the developing world, these are major, major cities. And we could find very little evidence in municipal documents that anything was going on. This wasn't focused on health. This is everything. In Canada, we looked at the provinces, what's going on at the provincial level, Quebec. Way above everybody else, this is probably mostly due to Uranos. Quebec is unique in Canada. It has what we call a boundary organization that coordinates modeling and projects and works with researchers and stakeholders to really push forward climate change adaptation um, research and actions. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a real tribute probably to Uranos and some leadership in Quebec on this. But everything I've just shown you is based on reporting of adaptation. So, if people don't tell us about it, we don't know about it. So what's going on in the NGO sector? What's going on in the private sector? Um, if we're not finding that cities and countries in the developing world are adapting, is that because adaptation is happening outside of institutions who have reporting mechanisms? Or is there, no is, is there no adaptation? Or is adaptation occurring more at the ground level where we can't find it? Okay, in a systematic way. We're also looking at government, governments. And they have to say somehow that it's adaptation or talk about climate change. There could be an amazing program that's relevant to climate change adaptation. But unless they give us some words that we can use to find them, then we can't call it adaptation. Okay? So are we just measuring reporting of adaptation, or are we also measuring adaptation? Probably a bit of both, right? Okay, so here's my quote. The next, next to doing the right thing, the most important thing is to let people know you're doing the right thing. Okay, that really applies in the case of adaptation. So if we're going to have shared lessons and learning around adaptation, we actually need to be able to know what other people are doing. Okay, also, just because somebody's doing something doesn't mean it's a good idea. So are the adaptations we're seeing Good adaptations. Well, well, you know, I'm still working on finding the adaptations. Whether they're good or not, well, you know, ask me in 15 years. Okay, that's, that, 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 that's late career stuff. This is hard. Hey, we can barely find, systematically review what's going on, but to decide whether those are good adaptations, that's tricky business. Okay, that's like, that's like asking, you know, is that a good relationship? Well, I, I don't know. Let me know when things have played out 50 years from now. Um, so this is a really hard question, and we haven't really touched this. We can attempt to get at it, but we're mostly get at it from, from angles, from the side. What do we think good adaptations? What are the criteria they should have? And 
we're sort of trying to go from the corners, but generally this is only done in case study, qualitative case studies. To do this systematically, globally, or in a comparative context, we're nowhere near this. So if adaptations are not labeled as adaptation, how do we know it's an adaptation? And how do we tell if it's real? Okay. What is adaptation anyway? What, what is it? What does it look like? How do we know when we find it? Like, how do we find it? Short of somebody saying this is an adaptation. This lecture is an adaptation. You know, <laughs> stick it in the database. How do we know what an adaptation looks like? And how do we know when we're adapting? We need to answer these questions. And we don't know how. For example, in the most vulnerable regions of the world, the areas we're most worried about climate impacts, adaptation is indistinguishable from development. So this is, um, this is a gentleman from one of our Batwa Pygmy Indigenous partner communities. And for him, the most important thing he needs to adapt to a changing climate is fresh water, reliable food, and security. Well, gosh, that sounds a whole lot like development. Okay? But adaptation funding is for adaptation. So adaptation funding mechanisms globally, if you want money from the Global Environment Fund, it can't look like development. It has to be something extra. It has to be beyond development. It have, has to have added value. So if you're building a bridge, well, they'll fund you to build a, a stronger bridge. right? But if you're going to fight poverty, will they fund you to fight poverty a little better? Um, or a little more focused under climate change. So funding mechanisms, we don't know how to spend our money and differentiate what proportion of this project is adaptation versus development. It's a huge problem, okay? Because in developed areas, adaptation and development are indistinguishable. And accountability for our adaptation funding, given this problem, is a grand challenge. It's sort of the elephant in the room. We're gonna fund adaptation to the poor countries. We've emitted greenhouse gases. We're gonna fund you guys to adapt. The, the fine print is you have to prove that you're going to adapt. Nobody's quite sure what that proof is gonna look like. We have ideas, but this is sort of this murky area of is the money actually going to be dispersed? And what does the proof need to look like? So there's a debate around this. Okay. So, I want to try and be a bit more pragmatic now that I've just confused you and, <laughs> and made the problem even bigger than you thought. You, you came here for me to like, organize the problem for you and make it smaller, and I just exploded it for you. So let me finish by being a bit more pragmatic and, and giving you my suggestions. Because at the end of the day, I have to at least try and respond to this. How can we adapt to climate change and not just be a theoretical academic and problematize it, right? That's what we like to do. Um, so first is the precision of data. We have to decide how much modeling and precision we need for decision making. We, the decision makers have to tell the modelers in the community, we don't care about that. We want to know this. Okay? We, this is the information we need, and we don't need more precision. We have to be comfortable with the fact that much of the uncertainty will never Never, we'll never be, in some areas we just won't get that uncertainty and so much of the uncertainty is us, okay? The human response. And many of the interventions and actions do not require more precision. We have to accept that. And we can, we can start focusing and, and bringing down the overwhelmable choices and the overwhelmable action to focus on priorities and actions that everybody agrees on for which there's co-benefits and no regrets. Okay. just to narrow down what we need to do. So we need to work backwards. We just cannot follow this linear path hoping one day we'll have enough certainty to implement something. Okay. Two, we need to define adaptation. Everybody hates me and some of my colleagues for saying this, um, but we have to agree on something for adaptation. I suggest we need to stop arguing about what is adaptation because it's a whole lot easier to talk about what's not adaptation. I don't, I don't know what to fund here, but I do know I'm not gonna fund this, okay? This is really not adaptive, okay? The rest of this is all gray. Let's, let's cut out the stuff that really isn't adaptive because that's easier. I would suggest that we start there. Let's come up with policies and mechanisms that exclude 
based on non-adaptive, rather than trying to find boundaries for what gets in and what gets out. There's data and skills gaps. So we need systematic collection of adaptation data so we can monitor it. We need milestones. We need to name and blame countries and cities and say, this is what these guys are doing, and, and you're down at the bottom. We need to have milestones. People, the research community hates indices, but we need indices. We need to quantify the unquantifiable at least a little bit in order to track and have milestones. There's skills gaps. There's very, very weak expertise in Canada in particular <clears throat> on economics for adaptation. The type of economics we need to evaluate adaptation is very, very weak. Big data for adaptation. Don't get me started. So most people in adaptation are in the social sciences. There's major siloization, meaning most people that work on adaptation would, would, would just throw up their hands and say, there's no way we should be working with quantifying and using big data. We need, we need to get the adaptation community, and we need to get people who have skills in computational analysis working with big data. For example, if there's an extreme weather event, Let's track cell phone movements and see how people are moving and responding to extreme weather events. Where are they going? Where's the vulnerability? Let's do crowdsourcing of responses to extreme weather events and emergencies. Okay, there's a lot out there. This is not reinventing the wheel. This is, getting on the, this is getting on the wagon that's been around for a long time. And the adaptation community is, 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 is sort of boycotting this area to a large extent. <clears throat> Leadership matters. We see over and over and over again with a new issue, okay, the major determinant of things happening at this stage in engaging in adaptation is whether there's a champion, an individual person or a group of people that stand up and say, I'm going to start. Okay? Where there are adaptation champions, things happen. We don't have infrastructure, we don't have systems that have adaptation sufficiently mainstreamed into them that they can just work that they just do the right thing on their own. There have to be adaptation champions. In a government ministry, adaptation doesn't happen unless there's somebody that picks up the torch. Hopefully we'll get past that eventually when it's mainstreamed, but right now individual adaptation champions seem to be absolutely necessary for the things that have happened so far. And finally, probably in the long run where we're going is gonna mainstream adaptation. So again, the, the Centers for Disease Control, I'm using them as an example because I was just there and they were trying to strategize and they said, well, we are the climate change group and we're supposed to deal with respiratory disease, but that's that group and we don't have jurisdiction over them and we're supposed to deal with diarrhea, but that's that group and we don't have jurisdiction over them and mental health, well, they're in another building. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of this climate change work is, is a climate change unit. But climate change needs to be everywhere. It needs to be something like you need, a, you need to consider a gender lens in every policy. You need an environmental impact assessment in every policy. Well, we need a climate change adaptation lens in every decision, every policy, every sector, every scale. At the end of the day, for this to really work and get where we want it to be, there has to be full mainstreaming of adaptation. It can't be a unit running around trying to inspire people um, in, in different units. And that is it. Thank you. I have questions to start with. So you and your students spent quite a time with then people in the Arctic, in the Amazon, in Uganda. How do they perceive climate change? We perceive it because we've got large amounts of data sets, right? It's quantified for us. How do these people perceive climate change and therefore the need to adapt? So I think the response is different. When we went into communities in the beginning, we actually didn't use the word climate change. Um, we focused on how does the environment affect your health? Um, how are you dealing, how, does your, how is your health affected by, by weather, by the environment, by water right now as, as a lens? Because if you go into remote indigenous communities, they're not, they're not, they're not going to say, oh, yes, climate change. We were just discussing that last week. Um, and, and the response really differs. So you go to the Arctic, and people say, the climate is changing. I was at a workshop last week. I know the scenarios. I know the projections. I'm worried about it now. Okay? The Inuit in the Arctic are very well informed, probably more so than most southern Canadians. Um, you go to Uganda, 
and people will say, climate change, I'm interested in it if you're going to give me food. Okay? Whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. I want out of poverty. And if climate change is the lens that's going to give attention to my problems, bring it on. Okay? Uh, Peru was somewhere in the middle. So Peru, there was a sense of, let's, let, let's talk about this. We are having issues. They are related to climate. We have got other issues. And, and we'll see if we want to work with you. So there really was a diverse response. But I think whenever you work with communities, except in the Arctic, where there's a real strong um, engagement with climate change, when you're working with communities, it has to be relevant to them. So we're talking about current weather, current var variability, and how people respond to existing storms and extremes. Please join me in thanking uh, Ray for excellent talk.